Good morning, everyone, and thank you for waiting. Welcome to the IRCC Study Permit webinar. As you know, there have been a few changes which have been announced very recently, and in our presentation today, we will be discussing uh, those changes and also sharing information to you about them. The presentation will be done by Shikhir Gupta, our Outreach Officer in IRCC Chandigarh, followed by a few frequently asked questions, which I will be sharing with you. And then um, Ms. Elena Balboa, our Student Unit Manager, will be addressing your direct questions, which we expect to receive in the Q&A box. So I would request all of you to kindly please type in your Q uh, questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. We will try and answer those questions, which are the most generic one and which will be relevant for all the participants who have joined in. My name is Anindita Buragoha, and I am the Outreach Officer for IRCC Delhi. And on behalf of IRCC, I would like to welcome you all once again to this study permit webinar. Over to you, Shikhir. Thanks, Anindita. A very good morning, everyone. And thank you for tuning into our webinar today. My name is Shikhir, and I'm the Outreach Officer at IRCC Chandigarh. We are very pleased to announce that as of October 20th, there will be more international students who are exempt from travel restrictions. As Canada looks at ways to safely bring in more international students, we wanted to also give you the opportunity to get updated information and ask your questions. Before we begin, please note that the contents of this webinar are valid only as of today. For the most current information on IRCC processes and travel restrictions to Canada, please visit our website www.canada.ca slash immigration. Some of the information from today's presentation may be the same as our previous webinars. We are hoping that some new people may have joined the webinar today to further understand the benefits of choosing Canada to study. So now let's begin. We know that international students make significant cultural and social contributions to Canada. Since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, IRCC has implemented a number of temporary measures to support and reassure international students about the study permit process. Today, we will tell you what those measures are by covering topics such as exemptions on those travel restrictions, processing changes due to COVID-19, a two-step review process, authorized leave during studies, impact on the PGWP or the postgraduate work permit program, as well as the recently announced DLI list. We will also cover important topics such as who can represent you in your immigration application and what you need to know before traveling to Canada. We will end the presentation with a Q&A session and as Anandata has mentioned, please use the Q&A box only to send us your questions and we'll review them after the presentation. For those of you who are considering studying in Canada, we want you to know what Canada has to offer should you choose to study at a Canadian institution. So why choose Canada? First is that many Canadian universities are highly ranked in reputed international standings. Canadian college and university diplomas are recognized around the world and the Canadian education system encourages cross-disciplinary studies to develop transferable skills such as critical thinking, teamwork, and communications. Second is that Canada is affordable and boasts a great quality of life with low cost of living, example housing, transportation, tuition in Canada is lower than many other countries including the US, France and the UK. Third is that Canada is one of the safest countries in the world with a very low crime rate. Canada is one of the most ethnically and linguistically diverse countries in the world with over 50% population not speaking English as their first language. And last but not the least, if you would like to look at living in Canada after your studies, IRCC offers a postgraduate work permit to students who have obtained a diploma from a post-secondary school in Canada and are looking to gain work experience. This is an excellent way to continue to live in Canada while diversifying and developing your professional skills. Now that you're seriously looking at choosing Canada to study or have already done so, you need to understand that currently many people cannot travel. However, nationally, we are seeing positive changes from actions put in place 
to stop the spread of COVID-19. We are taking precautions just like India by ensuring there is more physical distancing, mandatory mask wearing, and promoting good hygiene practices. Canada is working to slow the spread of new cases by cautiously starting to allow more people to enter Canada. So this brings us to the new announcement as of October 20th. Canada is now allowing students to enter Canada who are destined to designated learning institutions, also known as DLIs, which have an approved COVID-19 readiness plan, which is approved by the provincial or territorial government. As part of the DLI's approved readiness plan, they are expected to provide, number one, information to international students on health and travel requirements before they arrive in Canada. Number two, help students with their quarantine plans and provide guidance or assistance in acquiring the necessities of life, such as food and medication during the quarantine. And third, have a readiness plan to establish protocols for the health of students and in the event they are suspected or confirmed COVID-19 cases at the school. The list of TLIs with an approved COVID-19 readiness plan is now posted on IRCC's webpage for international students affected by COVID-19 restrictions and updated regularly as provinces and territories identify additional schools. This change to travel restrictions affects all international students, regardless of where they are traveling from or when their study permit was approved. Travelers should not make any travel plans until they have met all requirements and received all necessary authorizations. With the amended travel restrictions, immediate family members may be able to accompany an international student to Canada if their reason for travel is non-optional or non-discretionary, such as getting established in Canada in support of a student study program. This could include a spouse or common law partner or a dependent. Accompanying family members of a student do require a letter, letter of authorization to travel and must obtain that by writing to the IRCC COVID-19 exemption mailbox, which you can see on the screen. While writing to this mailbox, the applicant must explain why they feel they are exempted from travel restrictions. Through this slide, we want you to be clear that students who were approved before or after March 18th will now be allowed to travel to Canada, provided their DLI is on the list of schools with an approved COVID readiness plan. If it is so, their travel is considered essential. Please note that the March 18th important date was only applicable prior to the October 20th date, but now is no longer relevant. If your study permit is to attend a school which is not on the DLI approved list, your visa will be deactivated. This means that you cannot travel to Canada at this time as you will receive a no boarding message from the airline. So we are aware of many service disruptions that are causing delays in the processing of your application. All applications received between now and January 31st, 2021 must be submitted online. This allows us to continually process applications across our network through work sharing of this caseload till operations normalize. We know that panel physicians are operating with less capacity. This means that it may take longer for you to obtain an appointment to complete your immigration medical exam. We also know that some businesses and schools remain closed and are operating at limited capacity. This means that it may take longer for you to obtain the supporting documents you need for your application. All of that being said, please be assured that we will not refuse any applications for non-compliance or failure to submit the requested documents at this time. This means you do not have to worry about the deadline specified in the request letters sent to you. However, note that we will not be able to complete the processing of our application until all required and requested documents have been received. So it is in your favor to submit these documents to us as soon as possible. On the IRCC website, we normally publish processing times for each of our missions for all of our lines of business. As we are prioritizing applications for people who are exempt from the travel restrictions, these processing times are no longer accurate. We are gradually bringing back many of our staff while adhering to physical distancing within the office. That being said, 
Please continue to expect delays in responding to inquiries and uploading documents to your application manually. If you need to update your application or submit a document, please use your MyCIC account to send us this information. This will automatically upload your documents and information to your application without any delay. Additionally, to increase efficiency, please only send one inquiry and wait for a response. Sending the same inquiry multiple times uses up more of our already limited resources, which could instead be used to process more cases. So we know that uh, at this time, WAX remain closed. This means that there is no mechanism to submit biometrics at this time. We have started a two-way courier fee of Rs. 532 each way. We know that people are very anxious to obtain their visas. However, if you send your passport when it has not been requested, it will be returned to you unprocessed and at your own cost. Additionally, we may not be able to arrange for the return of your passport immediately, so be prepared for delays. Do not send requests for instructions. IRCC will send instructions to you via the email provided in your application. Additionally, we will post instructions on your Facebook page, on our Facebook page, and the India WAC website when it is opened up for everyone to submit their passport. We will prioritize processing based on the changes to travel restrictions. Applications destined to DLIs on the approved provinces and territories list will be prioritized for processing and will receive a final decision on their application if all required documents have been submitted. This means that if your application is approved, you will be issued a visa so you can travel to Canada under the exemptions to the current travel restrictions. If your DLI is not on the approved provinces or territories list, it will only we will only finalize applications which result in a refusal. If you meet eligibility requirements, your application will not be approved for a visa until travel restrictions are further amended or lifted. We still have cases that are awaiting approval in principle or AIP of their application. If you have decided to defer your studies or if you have switched institutions, please let us know immediately using your MyCIC account or web form if you don't have an online account set up. The AIP process was only for applications received prior to September 15, 2020 for programs starting in 2020. For all applications received after September 15, or for any application received at any time for programs starting in 2021 or later, your application will follow the regular process, meaning that you will only find out about approval of your application once all steps are completed. This means that these cases will not receive an AIP letter. Only refusals will be finalized, even if they are missing biometrics and medicals or either one of them. AIP is essentially the eligibility assessment of your application. You can receive an AIP even if you are missing medicals or biometrics. The criteria listed on the screen are the same criteria which will be used to assess eligibility of applications who do not qualify for the two-stage AIP process. Here are the criteria. Number one is that you're a genuine student. This means that you've demonstrated the academic and language capability through the submission of your previous academic transcripts and language test results, and that you're able and qualified to complete a program of study in Canada. Number two is that you've been accepted by a DLI in Canada. This means that you've submitted a valid letter of acceptance. Number three is that you have sufficient funds to pay for your studies, living expenses, and transportation without working in Canada. This means you've submitted financial evidence of liquid funds to cover the first year of school and demonstrated why explanation and proof of how you intend to pay for all of the remaining years of studies. Please note that if your application is refused and you did not complete your biometrics enrollment, you do not need to submit a refund request for your biometrics fee. We will refund these automatically. However, please allow us for some delay as we continue to work with very limited staff. So this slide reflects the documents needed to receive an AIP for the SDS and non-SDS stream. So first, let's look at the SDS list of mandatory documents for the eligibility decision. 
First, you need a valid letter of acceptance. Then you need to provide an IELTS test result demonstrating sixth in each module. Third, you need to show a receipt or documentation that tuition has been paid for the first year. Please include any scholarships or grants that you may have received. Fourth is to provide a receipt for a GIC of 10,000 Canadian dollars. Fifth is you need to submit your most recent secondary or post-secondary school transcripts. For Quebec-bound students, you need a CAQ. For the non scs stream, these are the mandatory documents for the eligibility decision. First is you need to submit a valid letter of acceptance. Second is to provide IELTS, TOEFL or PTE test results. Please note that no online language test results will be accepted by IRCC. Third is to show liquid funds to pay for tuition, living expenses and transportation for the first year of school plus an explanation and evidence of how you intend to pay for all of the remaining subsequent years of school without relying on working in Canada. Fourth, you need to submit your most recent secondary or post-secondary school transcripts. And last but not the least is you need a CAQ for Quebec-bound students. Additionally, we recommend that you submit a statement of purpose. Please note that if you're unable to submit a required document, for example, upfront medicals, your application will be moved to the non-SDS stream. Admissibility assessments will only be made if you pass the eligibility assessment. Otherwise, your application will be refused if you fail eligibility. For this, you must provide biometrics, complete your immigration medical exam, answer all questions truthfully and completely. This includes declaring all previous visa refusals for all countries, providing all of your background history for the last 10 years, and being truthful about any previous arrests and criminal history. And also, you must always remember to only submit authentic documents. Even if you meet all of the admissibility assessment requirements, only students destined to the schools on the approved DLI list will be finalized and issued visas. For all other applications where admissibility requirements are met and the student is destined to a school not on the approved list, their application will be on hold until their school is added to the DLI approved list. The travel restrictions are amended to extend to them or the travel restrictions are lifted. For all applications which do not meet either the eligibility or admissibility requirements or both, they will be immediately refused. So you must comply with your study permit conditions if your in-class courses are temporarily moved to an online only format or suspended completely because of COVID-19. To, to do this, you must stay enrolled in your DLI and participate in your online studies if your DLI offers them. If your DLI closes permanently due to COVID-19, you have 150 days to enroll in a study program at a new DLI, change your status to worker or visitor, or leave Canada. Many of you will have questions about working in Canada and how the current changes may affect your opportunity to be employed. So why is the PGWP important for many students? Work experience provides a better opportunity to gain the language skills and work experience required to apply for permanent resident status in Canada. In addition, Canada has some of the highest salary for workers. Furthermore, persons with Canadian work experience are often able to demonstrate that they have the skills, knowledge, and critical thinking required to do the job. It is worth noting that you can obtain up to a three-year postgraduate work permit. This all depends on the length of your eligible studies. You can also complete more than one program and combine their length towards your PGWP if each program is PGWP eligible and is at least eight months in length. New measures have been announced with respect to the PGWP program. You should know this information prior to entering Canada so you are aware of the rules. If you're unable to travel to Canada at this time due to travel restrictions, your eligible online studies will count towards your PGWP if you already have a study permit or you've been approved for a study permit or you applied for a study permit before beginning your program in either 2020 or winter 2021. 
for those who applied before September 15th for a 2020 start date we know that some of your some of you are still awaiting your AIP we are working hard to process these applications please make sure your application is complete or it will cause further delays this may be a bit difficult to understand so please listen carefully IRCC wanted to provide maximum flexibility for students to be able to obtain their PGWP if they have genuinely studied at a Canadian institution either in or outside Canada. If you fall in any of the situations listed above, you can complete up to 100% of your program online while outside of Canada if your program is between 8 and 12 months in length and you started your program of study between May and September 2020. This essentially means that taking an entire one-year program online outside of Canada may qualify the entire program for a PGWP. In addition, you can complete up to 50% of one program online up until April 30, 2021, while outside Canada if you will also eventually complete at least 50% of your program in Canada. Furthermore, you can complete up to 50% of two programs online up until April 30, 2021, while outside Canada, if you graduate from two different programs within two years of each other, and each program is at least eight months in length, and at least one of the programs started between May and September 2020, and at least 50% of the combined programs is completed in Canada. This means that you could potentially complete a one-year program outside of Canada and then take another one-year program in Canada and both programs will give you the maximum allowable time towards your PGWP. So this section applies to students who are already in Canada. Essentially, if a student switched to part-time studies or had to take a break in studies, for example, the spring-summer semester may have been cancelled due to the pandemic, they may still continue to work on and off campus provided they were previously a full-time student and already authorized to work on or off campus pre-pandemic. For off-campus work, the maximum limit is still 20 hours per week during the academic session and full-time during regular academic breaks. Please note that school closures, part-time studies or semester cancellation due to COVID-19 do not count as regularly scheduled academic breaks. If you decide to study and work in Canada, you may then decide to make Canada your permanent home. To begin the process of applying for permanent residence, you must submit your profile in the Express Entry online system. This will show you how many comprehensive ranking system points you have based on your education, work experience, language ability, and other factors. On a regular basis, IRCC invites the candidates with the most points in the Express Entry pool to apply for permanent residence through one of the federal economic immigration programs. Having a plan to quarantine is a very important piece to travel restrictions being relaxed for international students. Please make sure that you follow your quarantine plan. Not doing so could end up costing you or others COVID-19 as well as imprisonment removal from Canada and a fine of up to 750,000 Canadian dollars. Through this slide, we want to inform you of various fraud activities and misinformations related to immigration applications. We strongly advise you to scan the QR code on the screen for more information as I speak. So first, it is important to protect yourself. We always say that if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Please never share your personal information with unauthorized strangers. Second, the fraudulent websites and scams. Websites may claim to be official Government of Canada websites. People do this to trick people into paying money to them. Third, are email scams. IRCC will never send you an email from a private address, for example, Hotmail or Gmail. Please note that IRCC addresses always end in .gc.ca or Canada.ca. Then there are telephone scams. Please note that IRCC will never ask you for any sort of payment by telephone. Next are unauthorized agents. 
please note that you do not have to use a consultant to submit an application. However, if you choose to use one, please ensure that your representative is legally authorized to represent you. And you can do this by visiting canada.ca slash immigration dash representative. Examples of authorized agents include members of law societies in Canada, members of Chambre de Notaire in Quebec, and members of ICCRC, which is a regulatory body for immigration consultants in Canada. An authorized representative can provide you with valuable tips to avoid paying too much money for an immigration service, as well as what you can expect. Any, un any paid representative must be authorized. Examples of unpaid representatives are family members or a trusted friend. On this slide, you can see the many ways to connect with us. You can see on the screen the website for IRCC and also the links to our social media uh, handles for Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Please make sure to follow, follow us on social media for updates regarding the WAC two-way courier service and additions to the DLI COVID-19 readiness plan approved list. So this brings us to the end of our presentation. I would now request Anandita to address the questions which you have posted in the Q&A box. Anandita, over to you. Thank you, Shakir. So as shared with you in the beginning of our webinar, first uh, I will be addressing the most frequently asked questions which, ha which we have been receiving over the course of the last few weeks uh, since different announcements have been made. And then we will move on to the questions which we have been receiving in our Q&A chat box. So with that, I begin the first set of questions. And before I begin, I would just like to reiterate once more that due to the current travel restrictions, most students were not able to travel to Canada. But now, things have changed. And as per the new uh, exemptions, to be exempt from the travel restrictions, a student must be in possession of either an approved study permit and visa or a port of entry letter of introduction and their designated learning institute that they attend must have a COVID-19 readiness plan approved by their province or territory. One thing that you need to remember is that you should not travel to Canada until at most three weeks before the start date of your class for which your physical presence in Canada is required. So one of the most common questions since the new uh, amendments have come up is that what do the new updates in the travel restrictions mean for international students? Something which has already been shared by Shakir in his presentation. Amended travel restrictions which have taken effect on October 20th allow international students to enter Canada if their designated learning institute has an approved COVID-19 readiness plan in place. The list of DLIs with an approved COVID-19 readiness plan in place has already been posted on IRCC's webpage starting yesterday. And it will be updated regularly as provinces and territories identify additional schools. This change to travel restrictions affects all international students, regardless of where they are traveling from or when their study permit was approved. Travelers should not make any travel plans until they have met all requirements and received all necessary authorizations. The next question then is, how do I demonstrate that my travel to Canada is essential? With the new changes in place, the only deemed essential travel for students is for those who are destined to DLIs on the approved provinces and territories list. You will not be required to produce any other documentation to board your flight other than your passport, your study permit visa, and or your port of entry letter of introduction. All other students destined to DLIs not on the list, despite having reasons for not being able to complete courses online, will not be able to travel to Canada at this time. How do I know if my school is on the approved DLI list? This list, as has been shared, is already posted on the IRCC website. In the meantime, you should also contact your school directly to confirm whether or not their COVID-19 readiness plan has been approved by their respective provincial or territorial government. A few questions about the two-stage processing which has been in place uh, for a while now. Is the two-stage processing available for winter 2021 start dates? No, the two-stage processing will only be for programs that start or have started in spring, summer, or fall of 2020. 
How do I obtain an approval in principle? Is this the first stage of approval? An approval in principle happens in the stage one of review of your application. AIP is granted when an officer is satisfied you are eligible, will abide by the terms and conditions of your study permit, and leave Canada after your authorized stay. This only applies to applications received before September 15, 2020, and for start dates in 2020. What does an officer consider when reviewing an application to grant or deny an AIP? The officer weighs factors including, are you or your family established? Example, stable employment with a good salary. Does your course of studies make sense? You should explain why you choose this course of studies. Do you have sufficient language skills to show you are able to succeed in your studies in Canada? Do you have sufficient funds to pay for your studies and living expenses without relying on working in Canada? Do you have a valid letter of acceptance from a designated learning institute? What documents should you have to submit to receive an AIP? So if you were applying under the student direct stream, you'd need to submit a letter of acceptance from a DLI, an IELTS test result demonstrating 6.0 in each band, tuition paid for the first year, a guaranteed investment certificate for 10,000 Canadian dollars, most recent secondary or post-secondary school transcripts, and a CAQ for Quebec-bound students. If you were applying under the general uh, study permit application stream, then the documents that you needed to submit are a letter of acceptance from a DLI, IELTS, TOEFL, or PTE test results, evidence of financial ability to pay for tuition and transportation along with your living expenses, your most recent secondary or post-secondary school transcripts, and for C a CAQ for Quebec-bound students. These are the same documents required to make the eligibility assessment for cases that do not qualify under the two-stage processing. What if you are missing a document like medicals? Could you still qualify for SDS? The answer to that is no. If you're not able to submit all the documents under SDS, the officer will assess your application as a regular non-SDS application. What do I do if I cannot submit a document within the requested time frame? IRCC will not refuse any applications for non-compliance or failure to submit the requested documents at this time. Please submit the requested documents as soon as you are able, even if the deadline for submission has elapsed. However, note that we will not be able to complete the processing of your application until all required and requested documents have been received. How will I know if AIP has been granted to me? A letter confirming your stage one approval will be sent to you via your online account or email. Please ensure you check both. You may also receive additional request letters for stage two requirements such as medicals and biometrics. The next question is, if I'm granted AIP, can I assume that once I complete my biometrics and medicals, I will get a student visa? The answer to this is no. AIP is not the same thing as being granted a visa. The officer will still need to establish that you meet admissibility requirements. Note that a stage two refusal is uncommon provided that you are truthful in your application, you have not provided any fraudulent documents, and that you comply with any additional requests immediately. When will my stage two admissibility decision be completed? Your stage two admissibility decision will be assessed after AIP and before visa issuance. This includes an assessment of your medical, biometrics, as well as security and criminality background questions. If your application contains all the documents required for the stage 2 assessment, it will be assessed at the same time as stage 1. Note that we will not finalize any applications for approval for students destined to DLIs not on the approved list. The next question is, will IRCC issue any co-op permits to students upon receiving approval of a study permit in principle, which is the stage 1 approval? This is... So the answer to that is that a stage one eligibility approval is not a guarantee that a study permit application will be approved. As a result, a co-op work permit cannot be issued before a final decision is made on a study permit application. However, this does not prevent you from beginning your co-op program while abroad. The work permit is only required for work to be done in Canada and not outside Canada. So what are the requirements that are needed to complete the, to receive approval for the stage two admissibility decision? In order to conduct this assessment, you must provide biometrics, complete your immigration medical exam, answer all questions truthfully and completely in your application. This includes de 
clearing all previous visa refusals for all countries, providing all background history for the last 10 years and being truthful about any previous arrests and criminal history. Submit only authentic documents. The next question is, I have submitted all the required documentation for the stage two approval. Will I receive just an AIP or will I also receive the stage two approval? In order to give assurance to students wanting to start their online courses in the fall, cases are being prioritized to provide AIP. Stage two assessment will also be made for, will also be made for complete applications. However, applications will not be finalized or approved until VAX reopen. This means that you will receive an AIP letter for stage one, but no correspondence for stage two until we are ready to request your passport for visa issuance. The next question, which is also coming in a lot in our Q&A box today is, what if my schooling starts prior to me receiving my stage one approval in principle? You can start school online prior to obtaining your AIP. If you receive AIP after you started school, all the time will still count towards your postgraduate work permit, provided that you submitted your study permit application before you began your online studies. The next question is, will I receive a refund of my tuition fees if my application is refused when I am studying online in India with the DLI in Canada? So for this, uh, the DLIs are responsible for setting their refund policies. IRCC cannot speak to this issue, but students are encouraged to ensure that they are familiar with the various DLI policies relevant in their situation. The next set of questions are more related to processing time. So the first question is, is processing for SDS study permit applications faster than non-SDS applications? There have been many service disruptions due to the COVID-19 pandemic and we have not been able to maintain our standard processing times. We are working through the inventory of applications now and that is all we can say at this point of time. When can I expect a decision on my application? Again, there have been many service disruptions due to COVID-19 so our processing times are no longer accurate. IRCC is working hard towards normal service delivery standards. Applications meriting a refusal are being finalized at this time. So please check your online account or email in case you may have received a refusal letter. For applications to receive visa approval, only those destined to an approved DLI will be approved and issued visa. For all other cases, they will not be approved until either the DLI is placed on the approved provinces and territories list or the travel restrictions are further amended or lifted. The next question is, when can I submit my passport so I can get my visa? The visa application centers in India remain closed, but they are now accepting and returning passports via courier, via a two-way courier service, and if the applicant is currently allowed to travel to Canada. So you need to wait to receive further instructions via email on how to access this service. Applicants should not send in their passports if they don't meet this criteria to travel to Canada. The next set of questions is about language tests. So the first question is, can I submit a language proficiency test result that I completed online? If my school has accepted my result for my admission, is this sufficient? The answer to this is no. IRCC does not accept results from online language tests. There are no changes to the language proficiency assessment score requirement. The recommended tests are IELTS for English and TEF or TCF for French. We also accept TOEFL and PTE academic test scores from Duolingo or any other online language test will not be accepted for any immigration application purposes, including for study permits. What if my IELTS score has expired or is about to expire? We will accept the IELTS results as long as they were valid on the day you submitted your application. Does IRCC accept PTE language scores as proof of language ability for a study permit application? It is recommended that you submit language scores indicated on the IRCC website. However, if you have completed a PTE language test, you may submit your scores to IRCC using the PTE portal. Do not include your username and password in your study permit application. A few questions about deferring of your studies. So the question is, my application is still pending. What happens if I defer my studies to a later semester? So if you choose to defer your studies, ensure you submit a new letter of acceptance using the web form as soon as possible so we can update your file. The next question is, I received approval of my study permit, but then I deferred my studies. How do I extend my visa? 
In this case, you will need to apply for a new study permit with updated information. Extensions of study permits are only granted to students already in Canada. Can I defer my studies after I receive an AIP? Yes. However, you must submit new letter of acceptance from your DLI as soon as possible. If you change your course of study or decide to, decide to study at a different DLI, the officer may want to reassess your stage one decision. A few questions relating to the postgraduate work permit. So the first question is, when determining if 50% or more of a program has been completed in Canada for PGWP eligibility, how is the time calculated? The answer to this is that 50% of a total program of study is calculated based on the number of courses completed in Canada. In a situation where part of a semester is completed in Canada and the other part online overseas, IRCC will consider that the semester was completed in Canada. Applicants may have to submit additional documents from the DLI. The next question is, I have already completed 50% of my program online prior to the fall semester. Can I still obtain a PGWP? You can complete 100% of your program online if your program is between 8 and 12 months in length. You started your studies between May and September 2020 and you finish your program by April 30th, 2020. You can complete up to 50% of your program online, which is until April 30th, 2021, if you complete the other 50% of your program in Canada. You can complete up to 50% of your studies online until April 30th, 2021 if you'll graduate from two different eligible study programs within two years of each other, one of the programs having started between May and September 2020, each program being at least eight months in length, and you must have completed at least 50% of the combined length of the programs in Canada. Do we have to wait for AIP for courses to count towards PGWP? The time spent studying online abroad will count towards a student's PGWP after they submit a study permit application before or on September 15, 2020, and their program of study starts or started in 2020 or January 2021. Therefore, the length of the PGWP will be considered from the date the student's official courses began, so long as the study permit application was submitted before the courses officially commenced. Can I switch from full-time to part-time studies, and will this affect the duration of my PGWP? Students may put their studies on hold or become part-time students due to course cancellations as a result of the public health measures at DLIs and COVID-19. For the winter, spring and summer 2020 semesters, when a student's status changes from full-time to part-time due to changes in course delivery at a DLI, their eligibility for a post-graduation work permit will not be impacted. Starting in fall 2020, students who do not maintain a full-time status may not be eligible eligible for the PGWP. Moving on to a few questions about accompanying dependents. I submitted an application for my dependents along with my study permit application. Will they be processed at the same time? Yes, applications for spouse and children of prospective students will be processed at the same time. You must provide financial documentation to show how you will be able to support your dependents without working in Canada. Can my dependents travel with me to Canada if they have a temporary resident visa and I have a study permit? With the amended travel restrictions, immediate family members may be able to accompany an international student to Canada if their reason for travel is non-optional or non-discretionary, such as getting established in Canada in support of the principal applicant's study program. This could include a spouse or common-law partner, a dependent or in the case of a minor child who will be studying in Canada, a parent or legal guardian. Like all travelers to Canada, however, international students and accompanying family members will be subject to all public health measures, including the mandatory 14-day quarantine period upon arrival in Canada. To be exempt from the travel restrictions, the temporary resident visa holders who are immediate family members of study permit holders require a letter of authorization from IRCC in order to travel to Canada. A request for authorization to travel can be made by sending us an email to ircc.covid travel exemptions. And the, I will be sharing this email address in the uh, QA box so that you can copy it and keep it for your records. While you are sending us this email, you need to include the following information, which is documentation showing that you are an immediate family member of a study permit holder, why you need to travel to Canada. Uh, 
uh, right now your file number, name, and date of birth. And with that, I come to the end of the most frequently asked questions that I wanted to share uh, with all the participants and audience today. So now I would like to invite Shikhir El Elena to take on the questions which we have been receiving in the Q&A uh, box during the course of the webinar. Over to you both. Thanks, Ananda. Thanks. Uh, so, Alina, uh, I think uh, Anadatta has uh, pretty much covered a lot of questions uh, which, we've, which we've been receiving in the Q&A box. Uh, still, some of the questions which may require answers from you. Uh, so, the first question is, when will VFS resume for biometrics? So, at this time and for the month of October, uh, the VAX will remain closed. Uh, there is a, a team in Ottawa who is monitoring the situation on the ground here in India to determine when it will be safe uh, for the VAX to reopen. So this is being regularly uh, discussed. Uh, for the month of November, these discussions are still ongoing. We do not have a date yet of when the VAX will reopen. We are hoping that they will be open uh, sometime soon. But at this time, we cannot give you an exact date. Thank you. All right, Alina. So the next question is, students who submitted a complete application, including biometrics, and received AIP, when can they expect a final approval? So for the ones who have received the AIP, I, I'm also going to add a little bit more to this question because I do see in the chat and in the Q&A section about when will we do stage two. So just to clarify, stage two um, happens as soon as we receive all of the documents we need. So this could be at the same time we're processing stage one and then we look at your biometrics and medicals, right? Um, in terms of making the final decision on your application, this is really the holdup with many of the cases. And this is because there are currently travel restrictions for students. So prior to October 20, when only students who had visas uh, that were issued to them before March 18, we were not approving any visas at all. But as of um, October 20, when the DLI approved list was released, we are now uh, approving all of those cases uh, for students who are destined to DLIs on this approved list. And those cases, we will be sending you letters uh, or instructions via email to let you know how you can get us your passport. So this is this two-way courier service that was um, uh, mentioned by both Shakira and Anandita. So make sure that uh, please wait, <laughs> first of all, for those instructions to come to you. Do not ask us for those instructions. Uh, we will eventually get to you, I promise. Uh, and then secondly, follow the instructions. Do not mail the, your passport directly to us. Thank you. Thanks, Alina. Uh, so the next question is, if my college is on the approved list, do I still need a port of entry letter while boarding? So I'll be, so this port of entry letter versus visa, really you need one or the other. And really, this port of entry letter is for people who really don't need counterfoils. And for the Indian population, this does not apply to you. So for the Indian population, what you really need is a visa in your passport, your passport, of course. Uh, and what I would recommend, because you may be questioned about your intentions to study, so you should also have, uh, uh, you know, as a very strong recommendation for me, uh, your letter, a copy of your letter of acceptance, um, evidence of where you will be residing, especially for your quarantine period. So not just your quarantine, but where do you intend to reside? Like all of these things should sort of have been um, uh, sorted out or arranged before you're arriving in Canada. And um, uh, you should also have some evidence of how you're going to pay for your stay, like whether this is on your phone and you can show you can link to your bank account and you can show them funds, whether this is a copy of your GIC, um, whether these are, are um, receipts for the tuition that you have paid. So think of the things that, uh, up, you know, not just for the airline, but mainly for for the border services agency um, who will be questioning you on whether or not you are truly a bona fide student who is coming to Canada to study. So those are the things I would strongly recommend you bringing in addition to your passport and your visa. 
Thank you. Right, Alina. The next question is that will students with an AIP given priority when going for biometrics after the VFS get opened? So I'm not uh, 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 regrettably I'm not those discussions. Hi, Alina. Uh, Anindita here. I think there is a little bit of an, the network issue from your end. We are unable to hear you clearly. Prioritize for the appointment or priorities. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, it's better now. Yes, it is better Hello? now, Alina. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, sorry. So, uh, we are certainly discussing how we might prioritize who is eligible to travel to Canada once the v once the VAX reopen? Uh, because those eligible to travel would probably be the priorities for biometrics first before we get to everybody else. Um, as of this time, there is no no uh, set priorities of who might get biometrics appointments first. But uh, once we do know when VAX will reopen, we will certainly uh, let you know. Uh, and provide instructions on who who will be able to book these appointments first. Thank you. Thanks, Alina. So the next question is that my college is not on the DLI list. What should I do? So for schools that are not on the DLI list, you can do one of two things. So if your if your school is providing uh, online classes for a semester then you are more than welcome to take that online class. We've already made provisions for time spent on online courses to be counted towards your postgraduate work permit. Your other option is to defer your studies un until such a time that you are actually able to travel to Canada and take these courses in person. So really the choice is up to you what you feel is best for yourself. Uh, but please don't disregard this option of, of taking online studies. I mean, I know that uh, most students are, are studying in Canada for the purpose of being able to work in Canada later and then hoping that this will be a pathway to permanent residency. Think of the benefits of being able to, to take your studies while you're here in India or wherever you may be outside of Canada. So, number one, you don't have to pay for living expenses because you can continue to live with your family here. Number two, you also don't have to think about all of the added pressures and stresses of moving to a foreign country while at the same time juggling all of the academic pressures uh, coming from attending this new school. You can actually focus on, on academics uh, and, and not focus on all the other things that you'll have to worry about if you were actually coming to Canada now to study for your very first semester. So consider also the, the online option and don't, don't be so quick to disregard it because that time can count towards your postgraduate work permit, okay? Thank you. Thanks, Alina. So the next question is, will only complete profiles be receiving passport submission requests? If yes, what about the ones who don't have who haven't completed the biometrics yet? So the persons who will be receiving passport requ uh, request letters will be only those where we can actually approve the application. And in order to approve the application, that does include your eligibility requirements, plus your medicals, plus your biometrics. So if biometrics are still outstanding, you will not receive a passport request letter because we cannot give you a visa anyways, right? So... Um, Please wait for the VAX to reopen. Please wait until you can actually submit your biometrics. And by that time, uh, once your biometrics are in and we've assessed those, then we can send you your passport request letter if we are ready to approve your application. Thank you. Thanks, Alina. So the next question appears to be from a representative. Uh, he says that a student got a CAQ for May 2020 intake. But due to COVID-19, uh, the intake was deferred from May 2020 further to September 2020 and now to January 2021. So the question is, uh, does the student require a new CAQ as per Quebec requirement or can he uh, file his visa uh, with the old CAQ? That's actually a really good question and I haven't thought about it because I know that CAQs have been extended all the way up until the end of 2020. So if you were, if your CAQ expired any time prior, 
but you were starting your class, um, uh, you know, sometimes, say, for example, in November, uh, your CAQ uh, extension would have been all the way up until December 31st. Now, for the CAQs for or for start dates in 2021, if your CAQ expired in 2020, I, I'm not aware of any extensions up until 2021. You may have to uh, apply for, for a new one. Um, what I would recommend is that you visit uh, the the website for the province of Quebec, who who is responsible for issuing these CAQs, uh, and to look at their instructions of what to do in terms of potentially either extending or having to apply for a new one. Thank you. Thanks, Lena. So the next question is that can I travel on my visitor visa after receiving second stage approval and meeting all other requirements? or study visa sticker is mandatory on my passport? So as a temporary resident holder, as a visitor visa holder, you are currently banned from travel to Canada, even if your purpose is to study. The visa for which you are using to enter Canada should be for the purpose you are going there for. So if your purpose is to study, you should be holding a study permit visa. So the port of entry will not issue you a study permit uh, if you were to use your visitor visa to enter. So please wait. Do not use your visitor visa to travel. Uh, please wait for your application to be approved and for the correct visa to be issued to you. Thank you. All right, Alina. So the next question, uh, we've covered the answer to it uh, to some extent in the presentation. But uh, the question is that will parents of students enrolled in approved DLIs be given visas in January? So it's very difficult to tell right now what will happen in January, depending on the, the COVID-19 situation, whether here in India, uh, in Canada, or just around the globe generally. Uh, but what I can say currently is that uh, persons who are holding visitor visas, so the parents who are wanting to 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 travel to visit their, their child who is enrolled uh, in Canada in January, for example, uh, could potentially be issued a visa for the purpose of family reunification. Um, uh, so if the purpose is to, to just visit your child temporarily, uh, at the current time for the current travel restrictions, the answer is yes. But as you know, these, these travel restrictions are, are, con are continuously being amended depending on the COVID-19 situation around the globe. So, uh, it could change by the time January rolls around, but as of right now for the current travel restrictions, the answer is yes. Thanks, Alina. So the next question is that uh, I applied for my visa before September 15th and later deferred it to winter 2021 intake. Uh, I also started studying online without the final approval. Will it affect the postgraduate work permit? So as long as you applied for your study permit application before you started class, this should not affect uh, uh, the time to count towards your postgraduate work permit. Um, and just to add to this a little bit, so for those who have deferred their classes to 2021, uh, even if you applied before September 15, keep in mind the two-stage process with the AIP will not apply to you. So please do not look for an AIP if your classes are for 2021. So the, the process will just follow the usual pre-pandemic process where um, uh, the only correspondence you will receive from us is when we're ready to ask for your visa, uh, your passport to issue you a visa. Thank you. All right, so the next question is that, will we be allowed to do part-time job even if our course is online and we land in Canada? So, um, yes, if you are studying in, if you are already on Canadian soil, and the, the semester happens to be online. Uh, yes, you can work a maximum of 20 hours a week. We also receive questions whether or not uh, if you are doing online courses, but you are outside of Canada, can you work? So this work restriction is really for being in Canada. If you're outside of Canada, we have no, there are no such restrictions in terms of how much work you can do. Uh, because the really the the purpose of uh, of working in Canada is is that's the piece we need to control, and which is why we put the restriction uh, of how much time you're able to work in Canada. There are no such restrictions outside of Canada. Thank you. 
Thanks, Selena. So the next question is that I've received the AIP through email, but there are no updates on the IRCC website yet. Also, I had submitted by medical, my medicals, but even that is not updated on my IRCC account. So not everything you will see in your IRCC account. Uh, so you've received your AIP. That's fantastic. If your DLI is not on the approved list, so you should not be hearing anything from us until the travel restrictions are amended or your DLI gets on this approved list. Okay, so you just need to wait for us to, to send you a passport request letter. And that's essentially when you are able to travel to Canada, i.e. you are no longer restricted from traveling to Canada. Um, for the ones who are uh, AIP'd and your school is on the DLI list, please be patient. We are sending out passport request letters in phases uh, only because for our, you know, with a limited staff at the mission, we cannot take tens of thousands of passports at this time. We really need to, to stagger it uh, in order to be efficient and to make sure that everyone is served. So uh, please be patient for, for the person who wrote this particular question where it looks, it sounds like um, their DLI might not be on the list. Uh, please be patient. Please wait until the the, re the travel restrictions are such that you are actually able to travel. And that's when you should hear from us about asking for your passport. Thank you. Thanks, Alina. Uh, so the next question is, what about spousal applications for open work permit, which were already submitted? What will happen to their processing now that students are able to travel? And so are the immediate family members. So if the applications were submitted in a group, uh, we are certainly processing them as a group. So if you submit, if you and your spouse submitted your applications together, so one study permit and one open work permit, they are being processed together. So if both, if the study permit is receiving a visa, the open work permit ought to be receiving a visa as well. So both of you should be receiving uh, passport request letters. Uh, if you had submitted separately, meaning that your the the spouse had submitted much later than when the student had submitted their application, so we were trying to process according to date of receipt, so that spouse will just have to wait until we get to that application. Um, just so that you know, we are processing work permit applications, and all work permit applications are receiving decisions, whether approvals or refusals. Uh, just that there is a backlog we have to work through, so we ask for your patience. Uh, and eventually, these um, C42 open work permits will eventually get processed as well. Thank you. Thanks, Lena. So the next question is that my IELTS academic score expires in November. Can I use IELTS general score to apply for a study permit? So I would recommend. Uh, so if you haven't applied yet, I would recommend that you apply before your IELTS expires. Uh, for SDS, if you are going to apply through the SDS stream, that means you need upfront medicals in addition to all of the other SDS requirements. Um, they will accept IELTS general. For non-SDS, we will only accept IELTS academic. Uh, so you either do a new IELTS academic uh, if you're applying after the expiry of your current IELTS test, or you apply now before it expires, and we will we will accept the expired IELTS provided that it was still valid at the time of your submission. Thank you. Thanks. So the next question is that I did my medicals on November 2, 2019, which is going to uh, expire on 2 November 2020. I received my AIP on 13th August. Kindly let uh, tell me if I need to re uh, uh, redo the medicals as my previous medicals were already passed in GC key. Okay, so for those who have uh, medicals who either expired uh, within the last few months or are about to expire and you haven't yet been able to travel, uh, there are we are making some exemptions where we're extending the validity of medicals. So uh, not everyone will will receive a medical extension, but please wait for the officer to assess your case and let you know if you need to redo medicals. So you will receive a request letter if you need to redo the medicals. Otherwise, if you do not hear from us, we are likely extending your current medicals so that they can still remain valid until we can issue you a visa. Thank you. The next question, Lena, is that uh, is it necessary to follow the quarantine plan given by the university or we can follow our own quarantine plan, which would be much convenient for many students? 
So I'm not sure what uh, the quarantine plans are for the, that the universities are providing to you. Um, uh, this could be a condition of your enrollment. I don't know. You need to read the terms and conditions of your enrollment and what this means in terms of having to comply with their quarantine plan. Um, if anything, I, you know, the, the, the universities and colleges have worked very hard to put together these quarantine plans to ensure that you have uh, good spaces to live in for the, the two weeks of quarantine and that these spaces will allow for you to receive all of the necessary things you might need to survive for these two weeks. For example, you'll need food, you'll need medicine, you'll need, you know, whatever else you might need. Um, for the plan that you've set for yourself, you should also, if you insist on choosing that and if your school is allowing you to use your own plan, you need to make sure that you can, you know, th the plan that you have is equally as good, if not better than the plan that the university has for you. This is for your benefit. That's what I would recommend. Thank you. Thanks, Alina. So the next question is also something we're getting pretty often. Uh, they say that, is there a chance to move the biometrics collection from India to some other country or to the port of entry? So certainly there is no possibility to move the biometrics collection to the port of entry for students. You will not be able to receive a visa until you get your biometrics done, which means that you need to get your biometrics done before going to Canada. Now, in terms of doing biometrics in another country, what I can tell you is that, yes, this is a possibility. If you, want, if you choose to go to another country and try to get an, a biometrics appointment there and then submit your passport there for visa issuance, yes, you can certainly do that. But what we will not do is facilitate uh, this process for you. So you will have to wait the same amount uh, as any other client in that particular country uh, for, you know, whether or not uh, there is a wait time for biometrics collection, whether or not there's a wait time for visa printing, and whether or not there's a wait time for um, passport returns to you. So keep in mind that you'll have to take these things into consideration uh, if you choose to go to another country to submit your biometrics and your passport. Thank you. Thanks, Alina. So the next question is that, can I take one of the dependent children with me while I complete my college and PGWP? Uh, my child is 11 years old right now and will continue her studies at a Canadian school. What will be the process for the same? So if you have a dependent child who wants to accompany you to Canada, so number one, they should also be applying for a study permit. Uh, and, um, you know, the same requirements for that study permit uh, uh, is not the same as yours. So, for example, they don't need an LOA because they'll be attending, for example, elementary school or high school. Uh, and they're they're coming as your accompanying dependent. So it's almost sort of like what, um, what would be a, an open study permit. They can pretty much study anywhere uh, because they are, um, uh, you know, headed towards uh, elementary school or high school. Um, but yes, certainly they can apply for that study permit and accompany you to Canada on yours. Thank you. Thanks, Alina. Uh, so the next question is that if my spouse application is complete with biometrics, but my own application is pending biometrics, will both our visas be on hold or uh, he can still get his open work permit while my study permit application waits for biometric? This is assuming so this is our visas. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so this uh, the ends the question by saying that uh, this is assuming that our visas are not rejected. Yeah, so uh, this is very important for anyone who has a spouse who will be accompanying them to Canada. An accompanying spouse or an accompanying child is not permitted to travel to Canada unless you get there first. Which means if they're not coming, if you're not going with them, or if you didn't travel to Canada first and are already in Canada, they cannot go to Canada. So your spouse on an open work permit will not receive their visa until you get your visa first. Thank you. a lot uh, from, from a lot of participants, it says that the DLI is on the approved list, but the course is going to be continued online. Can they travel to Canada? So, yes, because the current travel restrictions doesn't, uh, doesn't make a difference of whether or not uh, your physical presence in Canada is required. The, the current travel restriction exemption is that your DLI is on the approved list. 
that is really all that's there. So like I said, what do you need to, what do you need to have when you're traveling? Um, your passport, your visa, uh, all the strongly recommended items like your LOA, proof of funds, where you're staying, etc. Um, but as long as your DLI is on the list, you are able to travel even if the semester is online. Thank you. Thanks, Lena. So the next question is, are there any chances of the DLI list to be updated as many colleges are not on the list? Absolutely. So the DLI list will actually be updated every two weeks. Uh, what I would recommend, because you have a direct connection to your college or to your university, I would suggest that you, you know, they should be your first point of contact because they can tell you uh, when they've gotten on the list. Well, we're only updating our list every two weeks. Uh, and for example, you know, we, we launched the first list on October 20. The next list won't be for another two weeks. What if your DLI manages to get on the list or now has an approved COVID-19 plan, uh, you know, and, and they get approved, you know, by the end of this week? They can tell you this and you can prepare for travel to Canada once they're actually put on that list in advance of actually seeing the list online. So um, talk to your DLI. Use them to get intelligence or information uh, of whether or not you will be able to travel soon. You know, some DLIs may not be interested in having international students physically be in Canada at this time because, you know, for example, the, the setup of their school may not be able to have all the physical distancing that is required at this time. So they will just have to wait until, um, uh, you know, such a time that the, the pandemic has sort of died down. But, um, uh, you know, there are schools who, who are making efforts to, to try to get students back to their schools physically, whether it's international students and domestic students as well. So really ask them for this information um, uh, and they can tell you whether or not, you know, it's in the horizon that they're aiming to get on this list or if they're not planning on having any students at all until, say, for example, 2021. Thank you. Thanks, Alina. So the next question is that, uh, is there any deadline on submission of study permit applications for the January 2021 intake? So I will say this for any intake, <laughs> and this is really important because this is this, uh, you know, I'm just thinking back to what happened this summer where we received thousands and thousands of applications, uh, maybe you know, a few weeks before the semester started. This is not feasible for us to be able to process all of these applications all at once because we don't have an infinite number of employees who can work on this caseload. So what I recommend to everyone, if you are intending to submit a study permit application, please submit it immediately as soon as possible. Do not wait. Frankly, you should be submitting a study permit application 60 days in advance of you wanting to, to receive your visa. That is my recommendation. Uh, why? Because that's actually the standard processing time, right? Um, even pre-pandemic, you are supposed to submit your application at least 60 days before the start date. But don't wait for that 60-day mark. If you can submit it now, please submit it now. It is to your benefit to submit it as soon as possible and to give yourself the most amount of time to prepare for travel. Thank you. Thanks, Alina. So the next question is that I have an approved study permit. My DLI is on the approved list. Should I expect to receive any further instructions or documents from IRCC before going ahead and booking my travel? No, that is it. So get your visa. Uh, make sure you have, uh, you know, all the evidence I talked about, like strongly recommended that you have with you on your plane. Uh, make sure you have your passport and, and go ahead and start making travels if your DLI is on the list. You do not need any sort of authorization letters uh, or any of that sort of thing to travel right now. So we we have a list. The airlines have access to it of who's on the DLI list. Uh, and um, and as long as you can provide evidence that that's where you're destined, you you should be able to travel. Thank you. Thanks, Alina. So uh, one last question for today. Uh, it says that how do I identify if my AIP is genuine or fraudulent? So we're getting a lot of uh, questions about whether or not this is genuine, this is fraudulent. Um, frankly, I suspect that these are uh, 
applications who may have, you know, submitted a paper application and have not linked their application to an online account. If you have an online account, you can see that your application is in process uh, and that, um, uh, you know, whatever's happening for your application, you, you can see some of that detail in there. And just assume like whatever you get from us is legitimate. 99.9% .9 of the time, it really is. Um, uh, there's various offices who are working on our caseload, which is probably why you're seeing, uh, you know, a few different formats out there, like depending on whether or not it's sent through the online portal or whether it's sent to you by email. Um, you know, all of these questions like asking for confirmation or, or uh, verification that is this legitimate, is this legitimate? I'll be honest, it's, it's adding to our workload and with limited resources right now, it's also slowing down. Um, us processing your cases. So think about, you know, when you contact us, if you have a question, try to look at our website, look at our, our social media to see if you can find the answer that you need. Because, the you know, the more inquiries that come into our mailbox, the more resources we need to take away from processing applications and making decisions to answer all of those inquiries. Um, uh, in terms of verifications, if you're honestly stumped, like, so think about this. A lot of the fraudulent documents we receive have, you know, uh, uh, all sorts of spelling errors, grammatical errors, etc. If this is what you're seeing in your in, in your document, it is likely fraudulent, right? You don't need to come to us for verification for this. Um, if you don't have an online account, I suggest you make one right now. Connect your paper application to your online account so that you can see that your application is actually in process. If we haven't refused your application yet, your application has likely been AIP'd and that AIP letter is legitimate. Uh, so please don't ask us to verify it. We are refusing applications, uh, you know, as, as immediately as we can. Um, so if you haven't received a, ref a refusal letter and your application is still in process, as per your MyCIC account, that letter is likely legitimate. So think about those things. Thank you. Thanks, Alina, for answering all those questions. Uh, so this brings us to the end of today's webinar. I would like to once again thank you all for joining us today. And we hope that the information provided in the webinar was helpful to you. I would once again request you to please continue to follow us on social media for the latest updates uh, on current travel restrictions as well as on the DLI list. Thank you for joining us. Have a nice day.